Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening for another town hall. Uh, sorry for the delay. We were just in uh, committee doing um, markup. So uh, finally done with that. And um, I'm really excited to be here with you all tonight to provide an update on the work that we've been uh, doing in Washington and in Minnesota and answer some of your questions. Uh, I want to first start by sharing a little bit about um, what Congress is working on at the moment. Uh, today, um, uh, as it sits, the biggest item on our uh, next uh, COVID relief package um, is what we are undertaking, which is the um, 1.9 trillion uh, American recovery plan uh, that includes many of the core priorities that we've been fighting for. Uh, it will have $1,400 stimulus checks. Uh, there will be $350 billion for state and local municipalities. Uh, we, we will have an expansion of $400 unemployment benefits, uh, $160 billion for contact tracing uh, and um, vaccine, uh, $130 billion for um, our schools so that they can safely reopen. Um, we are going to expand the foreclosure moratorium until September 30th, provide an additional $30 billion in rental and utility aid, uh, and provide $5 billion in housing for the homeless. The Congressional Progressive Caucus has been a key player in negotiating this package, including a successful effort in the House to ensure more Americans receive direct cash assistance. This has already passed the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, many of the details are still in the works, uh, but it is um, really exciting for us to, to be able to possibly pass this bill um, tomorrow or Saturday uh, morning. And um, it is, you know, a, a step forward, uh, and we will be pushing for more stimulus uh, packages in uh, the next uh, few months as well. Um, and so this is this isn't just going to be uh, the end uh, of aid and resources that we will provide um, as we all collectively try to figure out how to deal um, doing this pandemic and the financial crisis that many people are faced with. Today, we were also able to pass the Equality Act, which would provide uh, anti-discrimination protection for the LGBTQ uh, folks in our communities. It was an, a really exciting day to see the celebration um, and you know us take a step forward. Uh, it's protections that are already provided to Minnesotans, uh, but many people across this country live in states where they don't have um, the, the kind of protections that our residents have in Minnesota. And so to pass the Equality Act uh, and give that sort of opportunity um, for protection under the law, um, against discrimination for everyone um, was really uh, a joyous thing for us to, to be able to, to do. And I'm honored to have been um, a proud co-sponsor of the legislation and to have voted yes uh, on that bill. Uh, next week, we will be taking up the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which would address police misconduct, uh, excessive force, and racial bias in policing. Um, and then we are also going to um, vote on For the People Act, which or which is HR1, um, which will uh, include sweeping reforms to voting rights uh, and democracy to ensure a stronger and more equitable system for all. And hopefully soon we are going to do one of our coffee and Kulan conversations um, around some of the measures that are in HR1. Uh, and so I hope you all join us and you're enjoying those conversations as we dig deeper into some of the policies that we are um, advocating for and uh, you know many of our constituents um, are asking us to uh, take up. 
Uh, in addition to uh, passing HR1, we also need um, to remove other relics uh, from our racist history, like the Electoral College and the Senate uh, filibuster. Um, and we continue to advocate uh, for that um, and you know, look at what really is um, being brought forth as we uh, try to grapple with the events of um, January 6th and the insurrection that we've all witnessed. Um, it was made really clear that we need fundamental reforms to our democracy. Um, many of us are worried about the risk of democratic backsliding, uh, and it's going to be really essential for us to try to do everything that we can um, to make sure that our, our democracy is sustainable and it can withstand the difficult and challenging times that we are living through. Um, as we've uh, talked about, I just wanna look back really quick since this is our uh, first town hall, um, since we've gotten sworn in on in our second term, but some of the things that we were able to accomplish last term. Uh, as many of you know, we were able to um, uh, pass um, 28, bills and amendments in the House. Uh, seven bills uh, and um, amendments were passed into law. Uh, we introduced um, 60 bills and amendments, um, and we were able to co-sponsor around uh, 660 bills. Um, last Congress, we held 42 town halls and roundtables, and this cycle, we're hoping to surpass that. Um, we were able to also uh, secure federal grants um, in the amount of one, um, one million, uh, one billion um, seven hundred and fifty uh, million dollars, and have over seven hundred um, constituent case work. Uh, and we held over 2,500 meetings with our constituents. Um, in this second uh, term, we are uh, really looking to um, make sure that we are accessible, that we continue our tradition of co-governing, um, and uh, really trying to dig in deep uh, into um, some of the priorities that are being set um, by our constituents. Um, you know, earlier um, last month, we were able to uh, travel to Northern Minnesota and met with indigenous leaders about the Line 3 Tarzan pipeline. We know this project uh, would make it possible to meet, make it impossible for us to meet our state's climate target while also threatening indigenous treaty areas and the Mississippi headwaters. Um, we've also worked really closely with the Biden administration um, on uh, their priorities on immigration, the pandemic relief, foreign affairs, education, and other issues that are impacting um, our district. I was uh, proud to join uh, majority Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator Warren uh, in advocating for a $50,000 cancellation of student debt to lessen the burden that so many of our constituents are uh, dealing with um, in regards to uh, student debt. We've also been leading the effort to try to make sure that um, the survival uh, checks that, um, you know, we that are part of um, this package uh, are being uh, processed um, in, in a reoccurring way because we know that uh, the financial burden that people are feeling is not a one month thing um, and it's not a one time thing. Uh, so many of our communities have asked us to advocate for reoccurring payments. Um, and so we're pushing for um, $2,000 monthly um, reoccurring payments until the end of the pandemic uh, to help make sure that people can continue to feed their families, uh, keep roof over their heads, um, and uh, you know purchase things like necessary medication um, that they need. Um, we are um, 
advocating um, and uh, legislating on your behalf. And we're hoping that you are able to follow um, the official uh, social media sites um, so that you are able to get um, up-to-date information on how our office is working on your behalf. Um, and if you have not signed on yet, uh, you should sign on for our newsletters um, so that we can um, inform you uh, that way as well. Uh, so moving on now, I'm excited to answer some of the questions that you've all uh, sent in. We received a lot of um, questions regarding the upcoming trial um, of Derek Chauvin. Uh, while I can't really provide any specific um any specifics on the trial in itself, um, I can provide you with estimated timeline for it all. Starting Monday, March 8th, the trial begins. The first two to three weeks will be on jury selection. Then the trial itself is anticipated to take three to four weeks with a verdict being announced sometime mid-April. Um, and, um, you know, we are um, told that courttv.com is a um, way for people to follow the day-to-day -day happenings of the trial. Um, we uh, expect major moments, um, such as the first day of the trial to begin and the verdict to be aired on national TV as well. Um, many people have asked how can they um, with all the barricades that are being built, how can they participate um, and assemble uh, um, doing the uh, trial? Um, the north and south part of Hennepin County Government Plaza will have areas where people can gather. Um, and so we are encouraging people to you know, make sure that they're following um, the guidelines, that they're staying safe, that they're um, you know, being uh, informed um, and uh, and will continue to push for your rights to be protected um, and make sure that you have the access that you need in order um, to participate peacefully in uh, protests if um, you wish to do so. Uh, many of our constituents are also um, contacted us in uh, regards to the helicopter noises over Minneapolis. This has been an ongoing thing for some time now. Uh, my office has been in touch with the city of Minneapolis and other agencies to get some clarity around this issue. Um, I will be hosting a listening session uh, on Tuesday, March 9th from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Um, where constituents can come and speak their concerns regarding this issue. We have also invited local and state elected officials to be part of the uh, um, event so that they can directly hear from you as well. Uh, we will, uh, you people will need to RSVP uh, to receive the information for this um, event. If you are interested uh, in part, being part of the listening session, please contact my office. Uh, so that you can um, be given the information on how to RSVP. We are um, also getting a lot of uh, questions in regards to the rollout um, for the vaccine uh, and how that's going in our state. We know that uh, government Governor Walz has made great progress in getting the vaccine into people's arms. So far, over 1.1 million Minnesotans have received at least one dose of the vaccine. The vaccines are safe and are critical in getting us back to normal. Currently, several groups are eligible for the vaccine, healthcare workers, childcare workers, and most teachers, long-term um, care residents and staff, Minnesotans who are 65 years and older. Um, to see if you are eligible, you can fill out the Minnesota Vaccine Connector, which will notify you when you are eligible. Uh, if you think you are already eligible and have uh, questions on how to get your vaccine, um, please reach out to our office and we will help uh, connect you to um, 
to a vaccination site um, closest to you. Um, we are um, uh, also actively working in, in trying to um, help uh, liaison with our small business um, owners and uh, try to provide support for small businesses. Um, and so just a little update on what's happening on that front um, to answer some of the questions uh, regarding small businesses that have come in. On Monday, President Biden announced a new two-week window exclusively for businesses with fewer than 20 employees to apply for PPP funding. And um, many businesses uh, that were denied funding in the first round, specifically minority-owned ones, um, are encouraged to uh, apply and um and to uh, see if if their uh, eligibility um, changes uh, now that we have this this new window, the new ex um, exclusive window is very important to help businesses left behind by the Trump administration rollout of the program, uh, and the PPP program is designed to reach those hardest hit by the pandemic, who have not yet received federal support. It will also increase the amount of funding um, that can be awarded to sole proprietors or businesses that is owned and run by one person. Uh, the application window for this um, program closes March 9th. Uh, so you've got a very short window and we encourage you to um, you know, reach out to our office um, and uh, reach out to um, uh, SBA um, and uh, try to take advantage of, of this window. Our office will be co-hosting an event um, with Black Business Support Coalition and SBA on uh, March 1st at 5 p.m., which will have more important information on how to apply. Um, and we hope to see you there if you uh, need assistance and have questions. We've already done one um, specifically with uh, the, the Somali community um, that has really had some difficulty in, in accessing some of the small business um, uh, support that the federal government has provided. Um, another question uh, that we um, have uh, gotten about small businesses, which is, um, what's being done to help um, businesses that have been impacted by COVID and the uprising. Um, in the coming weeks, we will be uh, reintroducing our Healing Act. Uh, we introduced the Healing Act last Congress after the um, uprisings uh, in, in Minnesota and the, the, the damages that were caused to small businesses. Um, the Healing Act uh, stands for Holistic Economic Aid for Low-Income Neighborhood Growth. It is an economic relief bill designed to help minority-owned businesses and minority-serving entities. It will prioritize economic and business development funding for communities that are recovering from the impact of COVID, plus the um, civil unrest uh, of, of this past summer. Um, we've also gotten a uh, few different questions about the stimulus checks, so I'm going to run through um, where we are on those. Uh, eligible people should have received both um, stimulus payments by now. If you have not received the stimulus payment yet, you should uh, check on the status of those payments through the IRS website. Um, they have a tool called Get My Payment where you enter your information and they will let you know when your payment was and will be or will be sent to you. Uh, if you've not received one or both payments, the main option for you is to get it by filing your 2020 taxes as soon as possible and claiming the recovery repaid credit. You are eligible to claim all of the stimulus that you should have received and did not yet. Um, I will also be hosting a tax workshop 
in the coming weeks to help people navigate uh, stimulus payments, uh, taxes on unemployment benefits and more, please reach out to our office um, and um, or check out our social media um, for when that announcement uh, comes for the date when we will have that. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, we are finalizing the next COVID relief package that will include um, an another round uh, a round of $1,400 uh, payments. Um, it will um, uh, hopefully pass either uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, or uh, Saturday. Um, and we will continue to push for the um, reoccurring payments of $2,000. Um, we've also gotten um, some questions on the eviction moratorium and um, student debt cancellation and reform. Um, so let me start with uh, the um, eviction moratorium questions. Um, we, while uh, a decision to extend the uh, eviction moratorium past March 31st um, is a um, exciting one, uh, and, and we feel relieved and hopeful that we can um, work on uh, a, a long-term uh, plan in, in trying to um, figure out what, you know, uh, the, the plan is for our housing infrastructure. I know that many people um, have experience delays in receiving federal housing assistance. Uh, it is clear that the short-term rental assistance and temporary infection moratoriums are not sufficient um, to deal with the massive financial uh, ruin caused by this pandemic. This is um, why complete suspension and forgiveness of rent and mortgages uh, during COVID-19 has been one of my top priorities, and I'm hoping to reintroduce the um, Rent and Mortgage Cancellation Act as soon as possible. Uh, my office is also making some progress in our talks with Senate appropriators who are interested in helping us push funding uh, within our bills that are included in the Homes for All Act that we also uh, pushed for in the last Congress and hope to introduce again which would make um, historic investment in our affordable housing stock. Another priority for us is trying to call for the foreign acquisition fund and an anti-gentrification fund um, to be marked up in committees and possibly included in the reconciliation language um, of the bill that uh, is um, being passed soon. Um, and we, we are uh, continuing to push again for a holistic way for us to address um, the, the housing crises of yesterday um, and uh, the housing crisis of today uh, and the possible you know, um, catastrophe um, to our housing infrastructure um, tomorrow if we do not uh, systematically figure out um, a way to, to deal with it. Um, in, in regards to um, the student debt cancellation and reform, um, as I've alluded to earlier, um, my colleagues um, in the House and in the Senate and I have reintroduced our resolution calling on Biden to cancel up to $50,000 of federal student debt through executive action. The president has committed to um, looking at canceling 10,000, uh, but we know that that's not enough and we will continue to push for 50,000. Um, we are hopeful uh, that the more organized uh, we are and the more we collectively uh, raise our voices uh, that that cancellation will happen in, in the near future. This is um, one policy that I refuse to, to lose hope on uh, and will continue to push um, and and hopefully uh, see it, um, you know, find um, support with the administration soon. Mm -hmm. 
So we've also gotten a lot of um, inquiries on what's currently happening with racism directed at our um, Asian American uh, and uh, Pacific Islander neighbors um, as of February 21st, um, as of February this year. Uh, more than 2,800 incidents of discrimination have been reported across the United States and since the pandemic began. Um, on average, there are now um, 100 attacks on Asian Americans per day during the pandemic. The sharp rise in racism against the AAPI community was directly influenced by the way COVID-19 was covered during the initial outbreak, being referred to as Kung Fu, Chinese virus, and Wuhan virus. Um, that kind of rhetoric has consequences, um, and the consequences for the AAPI community has been violence, racism, and xenophobic attacks um, against the AAPI community are not new. Uh, it has been um, reinforced and strengthened during um, the pandemic, and we need to work together to find a way to combat this hate together. Um, if you witness an attack, please report it to stopaapihate.org. Uh, last week, our office held a meeting with Asian American leaders in our community to hear about their work their priorities and how we can continue to build solidarity with one another and combat the collective hate that many of us um, in, in, in communities of color face um, in, in this country. Um, we uh, have been asked um, about whether we are holding the congressional art competition this year. Um, it is uh been really sad um that many of the events that we traditionally do um have not been uh you know we haven't been able to to do them because of of the pandemic and i know so many people are um have continued to encourage us to to carry on uh, even though it's it's not going to be in in person and it will still be um, it will be virtual but it's still meaningful. So yes, um, all high school school high schoolers who live or attend school in Minnesota's fifth congressional district are eligible to participate and um, and we're hoping that you will participate if you have any questions regarding the art competition um, and ways that you can participate, please reach out to our office at 612-333-1272. Uh, and we look forward to uh, celebrating all of your uh, talents in the district. Um, we, let's see. We've also been um, getting a lot of uh, questions um, in regards to what's happening and what we or what we are doing around um, line three. Uh, and I just wanted to sort of um, spend a little time and give you all an, an update about the work that we've engaged in in regards to um, line three. Over the last few weeks, uh, we've devoted a substantial portion of our time um, in an effort to stop Line 3. Um, I traveled to Northern Minnesota to meet with indigenous leaders about their struggle uh, to maintain treaty rights. Um, I wrote to President Biden um, asking him to act on Line 3 the way he did with uh, uh, Keystone um, XL. Uh, I have spoken with um, many journalists and news outlets about the environmental costs of the pipeline to our communities, as well as how um, deep, how deeply it threatens indigenous communities. Um, recent reports from the Star Tribune and the Duluth 
uh, News Tribune have confirmed many of our worst fears uh, about the pipeline. The ma fast majority of the jobs um, are not going to Minnesotans. They are going to out-of-state workers to increase uh, who increase the risk of COVID infections um, as they travel to our state. At least one worker has been killed doing the construction of Enbridge um, and forcing construction to happen uh, at an unsafe speed. Uh, that worker was run over by a forklift. Um, accident like this would never happen, but especially for projects that are touted over and over again, uh, as the safer alternative. Um, indigenous leaders repeatedly raised concerns on how line three will increase threats to indigenous women. At least two line three workers were recently arrested after they've been um, caught in human trafficking um, sting. Uh, this is all on this is all on top of the known climate impacts and environmental um, disturbances. Every way uh, you look at it, this project is really terrible for Minnesota, for the United States, and for the world. Um, we must do everything that we can in stopping it, and so we, um, you know, are are going to continue to fight. Um, and stand with our indigenous communities and um, stand uh, against the, the catastrophe that's um, continuing to contribute to our climate uh, crisis. And we hope you do that as well. We, we have been, um, We've seen uh, an uptick in, um, in in questions and inquiries um, in regards to how we're fighting to for immigrant protections, um, especially as deportations have continued in recent weeks. Um, I know the last few weeks uh, have been really challenging for many immigrants after four years of Trump, many of us were hoping that January 21st would bring a swift change. Um, we have seen some um, major changes, uh, the repeal of the Muslim ban, um, the uh, remain in Mexico policy, uh, as well as many of the other executive orders. Um, the Biden administration also released um, an immigration proposal that has some truly exciting provisions, uh, most notably the pathway to citizenship for 11 million undocumented people. But while we've seen some incredible changes, um, we've also seen some parts of our system stay remarkably the same. Uh, I've spoken out against the um, new detention facility uh, for children, as well as against the increased number of uh, deportations. Um, we need uh, a real fundamental change to our immigration laws, including how we enforce them. Um, the answer isn't more humane jails for children. Um, there is really no such thing. The answer is to end the mass um, detentions of immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. Uh, in the coming weeks, we'll be working closely with um, my colleagues on immigration reform that recognizes our common humanity and um, and you know hopefully um, force this administration to um, really fulfill uh, the promise that they made in, in regards to having um, a just humane uh, immigration policy. We'll tackle a few more um, of the questions. I know that we are um, uh, over time um, because of, of the fact that we were um, delayed uh, because of, of committee work. Um, uh, 
we have let's see oh someone has asked uh what's the status of the no ban act um uh, at the moment uh the muslim ban you know um as many of you know is uh staying on our nation's history it's a direct violation of our basic pr principles um and uh under the the um equality under the law and religious freedoms uh we were really excited to see the biden administration um overturn uh, uh the the muslim ban on day one and we are thankful for the repeal of um trump's hateful ban uh but we now must pass the no ban act uh, and ensure no future president has the power to ban people based on their religion affiliation or um, ever again is able to, um, you know, discriminate people based on their religious affiliations. Um, and so we were actually able to reintroduce that bill today um, and we're hoping to pass it um, in uh, the first weeks of, of March. We have, um, the next question is about what happened to the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. Um, and it was uh, passed in the last Congress um, in the House. Uh, and unfortunately it didn't pass in the Senate and obviously it didn't get signed into law. Uh, and so we are taking it up again so today we actually reintroduced the uh, George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, um, and uh, and it is um, hopefully will uh, be voted on, um, and this time around it has the possibility of also passing the Senate uh, and getting it signed into law. Um, this is really um, an important first step in bringing real change to policing. It will eliminate qualified immunity for law enforcement, ban chokeholds, uh, and mandate data collection on uh, police um, encounters. So it is um, an exciting first step uh, legislation that um, hopefully will uh, provide um, support in that regard. Um, our We have um, we've been getting a lot of uh, questions um, in regards to what our uh, thoughts are and what's um, the on the ongoing violence in Ethiopia, in particular, uh, the prisoners um, who are on hunger strike. Um, my first trip abroad as a member of Congress uh, in 2019 was to Ethiopia. I am also uh, now entering at my entering my second term as a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the subcommittee with jurisdiction over Africa and human rights. This year, I am um, honored to have been chosen to be the vice chair. Uh, and the situation in Ethiopia for me is deeply alarming on many levels and I've been following it extremely closely. Um, yesterday, uh, we had the opportunity to meet with the wife of Jawar um, Hamoud um, personally, and I remain alarmed by the situation of the Oromo political prisoners and other leaders who are on hunger strike. The denial of access to medical treatment is a significant 
violation of their human rights. And it's only making the serious crisis facing Ethiopia worse. The Ethiopian government must treat these prisoners um, according to internationally recognized standards of human rights, due process, and human dignity. Um, it uh, really is, um, you know, a, an issue of, of um, importance. Um, the ongoing uh, conflict in uh, Tigray has also led to a uh, catastrophic humanitarian um, and human rights uh, situation. By some estimates, hundreds of thousands are facing starvation. Tens of thousands have left um, the country as refugees. Reports come in daily um, of new atrocities, including allegations of massacres in churches and villages, rape and uh, physical destruction of um, refugee camps. Um, and, uh, and to some accounts, you know, the whereabouts uh, and conditions of some of these people are still unknown. Um, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister um, Abiy Ahmed must allow unfettered humanitarian access and unfettered access to independent human rights investigations in Tigray so we can get a full accounting of the atrocities that have been reported. We must also lift the communications placade to allow NGOs and other humanitarian organizations to be in touch with their staff on the ground and to allow people living in Tigray and all parts of Ethiopia, um, including many of our constituents to you know, communicate with their families and, and be able to have access to the outside world. Um, I am, uh, you know, I will continue to, to, to monitor um, and make sure uh, that this, this tragedy that we see um, happening and unfolding in, in Ethiopia, um, that, that is uh, really just heartbreaking to watch, um, comes to end and, you know, we remain um, in, in close contact with the State Department um, and, you know, look forward to calling for uh, hearings um, on the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, to fully um, account for what is taking place um, and, uh, and what our response is uh, in, in, in regards to the situation. So we have a question um, in regards to what is happening with um, marijuana uh, legalization. Um, last week, uh, I actually hosted my first uh, congressional coffee in Kulan on this topic. Um, support for the legislation has increased in recent years. Uh, cannabis is now legalized in 15 states um, and accessible for medical use in 36 um, states. Last Congress, we were able to pass the legalization um, to federally decriminalize marijuana and sponge nonviolent federal marijuana convictions. Uh, and we will be reintroducing that legislation um, and be pushing for it on a federal level. Minnesota uh, representatives on the Democratic side have also taken up the, the mantle locally, and they just had a, a remarkable hearing, um, marked up the bill and uh, passed it out of committee. Um, and hopefully it will come up for a House vote uh, in the Minnesota House. Um, and I know that they are strategizing on finding ways to pass it in the Senate uh, and send it to Governor Walz's desk.
Okay. Um, well, again, you know, I, I just want to thank you all for tuning in, for giving me the opportunity to give you an update, answer your questions. Uh, I know this is not as interactive and engaging as it would be if we were um, doing this in person. Um, if you like the the way that we are now doing our virtual town halls, please let us know. If you have recommendations on ways to make it better and more engaging, um, we would like, love to hear from you. Um, we are looking for ways to improve uh, on, uh, on engagement and um, making our constituents feel uh, that they are getting the opportunity to engage with us directly. Um, you know, we have. Um, a newsletter that that goes out uh, regularly so please sign up for the newsletter um, we post our communiques whether it's press releases or legislation that we're supporting um, or sponsoring on our official website um, so please visit our official website our offices are um, close because we're working um, virtually at the moment uh, and um, but that still doesn't mean that we can't um, you know continue to, to serve and uh, engage so please call um, and uh, schedule meetings uh, and you know we, we would love to um, engage with you in in that regard thank you so much for spending your uh, Thursday evening with us and hopefully we'll uh, see you at our next town hall Thank you very much.